In this video, together with Dennis Strang, the host of People of Pathology podcast, we are going to be talking about why we are podcasting, why we are inviting the guests we're inviting, and why we ask the questions we're asking. We are going to take you behind the scenes of pathology podcasting and talk about ourselves a little bit as well. Hi, I'm Alexandra Zhurev, and I help you do better digital pathology. So if this is what you want, this is your place, the digital pathology place. Today, not only will we take you behind the scenes of pathology podcasting, but if you're interested in starting your own pathology or science show, be sure to stay till the end because we're going to give you some insider tips and tell you what's important and what's not. And if you like it, click the subscribe button to be notified every time we release a new video. Let's jump into it. Today, I am with Danny Strang, the host of People of Pathology. Hi, Dennis. How are you today? I'm good, Dr. Zeroff. How are you? Great. Thanks for joining me. Yeah. And <laughs> this is our second attempt. We right. did this already. We did it live. And it was, let's so to say, due to technology glitches, it was suboptimal. So we decided, like podcasters, we're going to pre-record. So that's right. what we're doing today. So let's start, let's start with you. Let's um, give a short intro about yourself and about your podcast and why you started podcasting. And we're going to be kind of interviewing each other. So I'm going right. to be answering the same questions I'm asking right now. Yeah, so I'm a pathologist assistant, which is a job that I've been doing for, I guess, 18 years now. Yeah, 18 years, almost 19. And so, so my, the basic job then is I am responsible for uh, documenting and dissecting tissue specimens that come out of surgery. And then we select, or I select uh, uh, sections, representative sections of those tissues to get submitted for processing, which are then cut by the histotechs and made into slides, which the pathologist then reads. Um, so that's that's kind of my my basic job. And some some pathologist assistants work in forensics and autopsies. Some work in lab management, uh, frozen sections, other areas like that. As far as the podcast, the People of Pathology podcast. So that started in uh, I think December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And that, that came out of a conversation that I had with another pathologist assistant, and we were talking about podcasts that we liked, and how uh, the, the ones that we liked the most were interview style. And we noticed mm -hmm. that, yeah, and we noticed that there weren't any that were about uh, people in the lab, or, you know, pathology professionals or the lab professionals. And she said, well, you should, you should start one. And I'm writing a book, so you could, you could interview me about the book. Okay, so I started looking into it. And, and I, I'm curious if you had the same experience. And you look into it and you go, all right, what do I need to start a podcast? And how much will it cost? And, you know, and what I found was it wasn't that hard and it wasn't that expensive. You just had to you know, get a microphone, uh, get a way to record and some kind of hosting platform and just you know, it, it didn't cost that much money. So I did that. I interviewed her and that became uh, the first episode. Although much, much like this recording, we had to do it twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it just kind of, just kind of grew from there. That happens sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like same for me about the podcasting. It was like the barrier to entry was low to share your message or, you know, to spread expertise. Uh, did your friend finish the book? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, well, actually, no, she didn't finish that book, but she ended up writing a different book. Oh, really? Uh, it's, yeah. So I had her, uh, yeah, that uh, something happened with the, the the publishing I don't even know what it was but she so she wrote a different book and so I had her back on uh like I think it was earlier this year maybe late last year for to, to, to talk about that about that book one. yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah so I am a veterinary pathologist by training and now doing toxicologic pathology as my day job 
as my main job, so to say, uh, beside being a podcaster. And toxicologic pathology uh, is looking at tissue to see if there are changes caused by potential drug candidates. So we are working with animal tissue and the, the difference between a diagnostic pathologist, be, be it um, an MD pathologist or a DVM veterinary pathologist that are doing diagnostics, a toxicologic pathologist looks at um, a study level not at a single animal level. We don't like write report about sing changes in a single animal. We write reports about what this uh, drug candidate caused um, in different groups, depending on the dose. So it's like, I would say it's population level rather than individual level, if we, if we want to call population. So it's a little bit of a different approach. And the goal is, okay, the drugs that later uh, go to the clinical phase, because what I'm doing is the preclinical phase of drug development. And um, we have to check, okay, are they safe enough to move on in the drug development pipeline? So that's the day job. That's what a toxicologic pathologist does. But... I also have a passion for a digital pathology that comes from my previous job, which was a digital pathology company, uh, image analysis company. Now this company is integrated into uh, another company. It was uh, called Definions. And there is where I developed passion for image analysis and digital pathology. And I've noticed that in this area, um, scientists from different backgrounds have to work with each other and talk to each other. And those different backgrounds were pathology or life sciences and computer science. And there was a big gap between those two groups, gap in background knowledge and gap in communication styles. So that was basically my role in the job. I was bridging this gap as a pathologist. So I had to learn the computer science part of image analysis and uh, I had to teach pathology or the necessary pathology knowledge and pathology concepts to the computer scientists who were doing the algorithms. Um, and after I left this company, I wanted to have an anchor to this area because I developed a passion for that. So I started the blog a blog with article with resources, both for computer scientists and for pathologists uh, to bridge this gap. And then as an evolution of that, a podcast uh, was made, Digital Pathology Podcast. The website is called Digital Pathology Place. And my goal there is to still keep bridging the gap. So that's how I started podcasting. And... Um, but before we go into the deeper dive into podcasting and how we podcast and why and, and what, um, Dennis, can you tell me something cool about you, something that you're proud of that has nothing to do with your job or podcasting? Yeah, and I think, I know we've talked about this one before. So I the am... second time, but that's <laughs> fine. Right. Um, so I started... Uh, I guess it was almost 10 years ago now, I started uh, trail running. And then that turned into ultra running, which uh, is crazy. But this is, so an ultra marathon is anything that's longer than your standard 26 mile marathon. Um, and so you just, you go out and you just run for hours. And it, these are usually on trails. So at least the scenery is really nice. Um, the... So I've done uh, a couple of 50Ks. I did one 50-miler and one uh, 100K. It was that, that was my longest run, which took, uh, which took 18 hours. Now, oh that's, that's really slow. The people that win these things do it in, I, I think, less than half that time. But it was, it was fun, and I, I, I hope to do it again. And, and like the, kind of, the goal is the 100-miler, you know, which... I haven't done yet, but that's that's kind of the goal. So maybe in a, a year or two, I can try to go miles. So it's 160 kilometers. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness. So I have a similar a similar, well, something that I'm proud of. But because you already did the running, <laughs> said the running, I'm going to talk about something else. But uh, my longest was um, 50, 60k or 50 54k. 
something like that. It was also in the mountains and it took me, I don't remember, over 10 hours, but I don't know if more, like a lot more often hours, was a couple of years ago. And since then, now after having two kids, I decided that the distance compatible with life for me is 5K. <laughs> so that's what I'm focusing on right now. But one thing that I'm really proud of is um, I uh, live in the U.S., but I'm originally from Poland. And it was important for me that my kids speak Polish. So I was speaking uh, Polish to them since they were born. And, the old, and we went to Poland this summer. And the older one, he's going to be three in uh, December. After six weeks in Poland with my mom and with my family and everybody there speaking Polish to him, he's fluent in Polish. And I'm so proud of that. It's more proud of oh. my kid, but I'm proud of myself that I uh, stuck to it and that I really spoke Polish to him. So he had enough background knowledge of the language to go there and in six weeks develop like active, active Polish speaking. And he now speaks Polish to me and English to his dad. And we also oh. do Spanish, but on vacation, we focused on Polish. Oh, that's great. Like I, my family background is Polish too, but, and I know maybe two or three Polish words, but yeah, I, I would like to become fluent in Polish someday. And actually speaking of the language thing, I had a pathology resident from Brazil on my podcast on a couple of months ago now. Mm -hmm. And she told me after we were done that that was the first time she had spoken English out loud ever. Really? Which, yeah. Which I didn't know. So I thought, okay, if she can do that, you know, and it's Brazil, so it's Brazilian Portuguese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought, all right, maybe I can learn a little bit of Portuguese. So I've got one of those, uh, I think it was Duolingo apps or yeah, whatever. Yeah, Duolingo. I know. Yeah, so I started learning a little bit of, of Portuguese, which isn't going really well, but you know, it's it's a start. Cool. It's a, it's an inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. So. So yeah. you had this uh, this person from Brazil. You had your friend who wrote a book. How mm -hmm. do you choose your guest for your podcast? That uh, at the beginning that came a lot from uh, Twitter. So mm -hmm. I find people that were very you know active on Twitter or had you know posted an article or some something interesting that I wanted to learn more about. Um, sometimes it's from LinkedIn. Uh, mm -hmm. These days it's like. I, 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 you know, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn and Twitter and, uh, you know, other things too. And it's like, I find a topic and it has to be something that is interesting to me mm -hmm. first. And then there, once I have that, then I can kind of, you know, connect with the person and sort of reach out and kind of discuss with them. And if they're interested, then they can come on, uh, you know, then we'll talk about what, what we're going to, you know, what we're going to discuss and, and that kind of thing. So it kind of, I don't know. It's, it's sort of, I don't really have a standard, I guess, way of doing it. It's mm -hmm. just kind of whatever I happen to see that sounds interesting and I want to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. And so why do you even like, why do you have people of pathology? I know you had like friends and what's the goal? Why do so, you want to keep podcasting in this niche and with the, these people? Yeah. So the goal is there's other podcasts that focus on kind of the the industry or the, you know, what's the latest, yeah, right. What's, you know, what's the latest staging criteria for whatever kind oh, okay. of tu tumor, you know, and I want us to focus on the people working in these fields. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, sort of, I, I hope that people outside of the fields hear these interviews and they think, you know what, that's, that sounds interesting. Maybe that's something I'd like to do you know, right, to inspire other people to do these things, whether it's become a pathologist or a pathologist assistant like me, or, you know, I have medical laboratory scientists, mm -hmm. people in forensics, all kinds of things. And um, as, as I go along and I've got more episodes and things, I hear once in a while from people and they say, yeah, you know, I've heard this episode and it was really inspiring to me and it, you know, and I, I want to check out that career. Cool. I had some, yeah, I had got an email from someone just recently who she, uh, she's a medical student and she decided from listening to one of my interviews that she was interested in forensic pathology. And she actually reached out to one of the forensic pathologists that I interviewed for mm -hmm. some career advice. So that, that was really cool to hear. 
So yeah, it, it's that kind of stuff. Like I'm trying to highlight these fields and then maybe inspire other people to to look at them and, and to pursue them for themselves. Mm. Yeah, I think you know what's cool as well. As you look, you say you you pick your guests on Twitter because they already have something interesting to say, and then you see other discussions. And you know that one of your podcast episodes is actually an answer to the question that people are asking in that discussion. So I like that a lot as well, that you can just give something that you made, that, that you produce, so to say, and it is of value to people that are discussing the subject. And this, I think, counts for, for both of us. So my podcast, as I said, is to bridge the gap between computer scientists and pathologists. And um, it is more, um, it has this focus and it is more industry oriented because uh, usually uh, or very often this gap is bridged by a tool like a software tool that um, I both computer scientists and pathologists are using or computer scientists are designing and pathologists are using. So I do showcase uh, industry partners, industry um, players, companies that have those tools. And then um, what I want to know, so they have, it has to be digital pathology, obviously my podcast is about digital pathology, but I'm focusing on bridging the gap. So this is how I choose my guests. There are many guests in the field of digital pathology that would be interesting, but don't really provide this particular thing that I'm trying to deliver with my blog and with my uh, podcast. So that's my criterion. If there is a contribution to bridging the gap, they're on it. I'm inviting them and, you know, also, a lot of the the no well no who so to say is from social media so what's your favorite platform you say twitter and linkedin do you have a preference uh, these days uh it's linkedin i yeah. feel like yeah it, it's it, it's i guess it's more varied you know you can get it you know when you're on twitter and you on you know pathology uh you know, type, type of focus that gets very narrow. And I found that LinkedIn, I can branch out a little bit more mm -hmm. and kind of get into some, I mean, I've gotten to some very sort of obscure forensic science areas that I've never heard of myself. Oh, really? And From was, LinkedIn? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think LinkedIn, the, the um, character the, the, of the platform is just professionals and business oriented. So, so both of those categories are the people who hang out there that would be guests on our podcast, professionals in industry. So LinkedIn definitely for also for spreading the word. I do quite some yes. Instagram. I like Instagram as well. So I, I have uh, quite a following on Instagram. Um, I don't know. It's more to build and give value there than probably take them uh, take people make people listen to my podcast but I like Instagram so I'm doing okay. that as well I just recently started doing some things on Instagram you do okay fantastic yeah. then I can tag you and I when yeah. we post this I can tag that we did it <laughs> yeah for sure yeah yeah so uh, whoever you know is listening to this and was a guest on my podcast and doesn't have an Instagram account if you have it I can tag you so do it <laughs> So we know where we have our guests from, how we choose them. Why do you ask the questions you ask? Okay, so there again, for me, it's the focus on the people. So I want to know the, the particular person's story, how they how they started. Like I found that a good place to start is all right. What you know, what person or what experience did you have that influenced you? to get into this field in the first place. Mm -hmm. And everybody's got a different answer to that question. So that's, I, I like to answer, I like to ask those. And, you know, like I said, I'm trying to inspire other people to look at these fields. And so it's, okay, what was your path to get there? Was it a straight line? Did you, you know, if you're a pathologist, did you go high school to college, to medical school right away, mm -hmm. to residency right away, whatever. And a lot of people don't do that. You know, did you, 
did you get into med medical school on the first try? Did it take you a couple of tries mm -hmm. like that? Because if, if there's somebody out there who's going, you know what, I, I wanted to go to medical school, but I don't have the grades or, you know, I didn't get in the first time or I didn't get into my, you know, number one, I didn't get matched to my number one residency mm -hmm. program, whatever you can, those things can happen to you and you can still be successful and you can still, you, you know, I, I found that most people, their career path is not a straight line at all. It has a lot of curves to it. And I would like to highlight those things. So I try to pick questions that will, uh, that will highlight those things. And then of course, there's always one or two major topics that I want to talk about which, with each person. So I tend to leave that stuff more towards the end. Um, and, and you know, and I'll have a few questions about each of those things, depending mm -hmm. on what they are. Yeah, that's, I think the perception is like when you are an MD or DVM, you had to be like, fantastic always all along the way had the best grades and yeah. uh, this is your path so it's super important what you're highlighting and I actually had not such a straight path to where I am right now now I'm a board certified uh, American College of Veterinary Pathologist board certified pathologist so to me uh, the path when I finished my university was okay you have to like get matched to some American residency I was in Poland at that time so I sent my application to the U.S. And never heard from anyone, like, really, it's so competitive. I, like, I was, you know, disappointed at the beginning, but then I looked at that and I'm like, okay, I'm not even in that system. I'm not part of the candidate pool that uh, are applying for this highly competitive, you know, immediate path to residency and becoming a veterinary pathologist. So um, I worked as a clinician, as a clinical veterinarian in a mixed animal practice for a couple of years. And, you know, if you want to hear more about it, listen to the episode where I was the guest on Dennis' podcast. But I just right. want to talk to this, um, to this particular point that um, then, like through the back door, starting a PhD program in Poland, I went for a, an exchange for a limited number of weeks to Germany, and then I somehow managed to convince those people to keep me there so stayed there for a, first some kind of externship then it turned into a PhD in the residency program that ultimately led me to taking the American boards and um, working as a toxicologic pathologist in the U.S. so not a straight path and to everyone who is from a different country doesn't have the best grades I so I didn't have the best grades. Uh, in Poland, it's rather, and, and in Europe, I know this from Germany, it's rather pass or fail. So the minimum to pass gives you a pass and then it doesn't matter really. You have grades and if you're like aspiring to get um, scholarship for that, then you like re work really hard for that. But other than that, everybody then at the end is DVM and you more or less have the same chances. But then if I, when I had to show my grades, obviously in comparison with other people from mostly from the US, that was not impressive. But yet I made it <laughs> to where I am. Right. And, right. <laughs> so. Which, by the way, that was episode number 53 of the People of Pathology podcast. If you want to hear the rest of that story. I'm going to left... link the link to this episode in the description below. <laughs> and you left out the part about that you wanted to work with cows. Yes, I did. I did. I'm going to keep that so that people go and, and listen to, to the episode. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So same story here. Why I ask the questions I ask? Because I have a certain mission with the podcast and the questions answer, you know, build the bridge. So I do that and um, I have like an outline of questions. So everybody who is my guest, they get a, a, an outline of a couple of questions that are standard, that are gonna be in every episode. But then from those questions, I branch out to whatever is interesting, whatever I think is, uh, will be relevant. So it has a little bit of a structure, but then a flow of, you know, going wherever we, we feel we want to go and wherever I think is relevant to, to my audience. Do you have a favorite question? I do. This has kind of changed for a while. I, I liked the kind of, how did you get interested in the field? And, I, and mm -hmm. I still use that question. But lately I've been looking at, 
because I found that a lot of people in pathology have kind of a creative side and maybe a side like hobby or something. That's what I see on Instagram a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So I started asking that question, like, what is the link between uh, being in pathology and lab medicine and, and art, whether it's painting or photography is a big one. Uh, mm -hmm. Music is a big one too. And, and like, what is the link with that? And so I asked that question the, probably the last three or four uh, episodes now. And I, I'm going to keep going with that, just to kind of explore that a little bit more. So I, yeah, I like that. I like that question. I think that's my favorite now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My favorite questions are the clarifying questions. So it's not really mm, a specific okay. question, but I like, you know, I have the framework and then people are answering the questions and mostly it's um, informational about their company or about their work that's going to bring value to people who are doing digital pathology. But then when you branch uh, into, like, dive a little bit deeper or, or want to clarify, I want this, uh, the podcast message and, and whatever the offer is of the company um, I'm interviewing to be super clear. So that people, when they listen to this, okay, hmm, my need is this and this and this. This uh, company actually has offer for these particular needs. So like really narrowing down and clarifying what, like translating, translating and building this bridge, translating to people um, that maybe are just beginning the journey. Often I see the website of digital pathology companies and I know what they're offering because I know them personally and you know I worked in the space. But um, sometimes when a new player comes uh, into the market, I look at the website and it's not clear to me, who is it for? What are you exactly doing? The digital pathology area, it isn't a niche in pathology, obviously like every specialty, but it's broad enough that you need to really say, who is it for and what is it? And I have the impression that sometimes on the website, it, it's purposely uh, kept broad, too broad for a person to go there and actually know, oh, is it for me or not? So this is what I wanna do in the podcast. I know, um, and, and these questions that help narrow that down are my favorite ones because it's for me also when I have to recommend somebody or when I want to recommend I know okay this company does exactly this and this and this and this is what you're looking for so have you ever had someone that you interviewed and when you'd ask these court clarifying questions maybe later on they would say or, you know like they would change the description on their website or something like that to make it more clear like because of what they talked about with you mm. I, not really as a podcast guest, but just in other conversations, that would be something I um, I ask. Okay, you have. I see you want to help this group of people, but from your website, it looks like it's not so clear. And they're like, hmm, "Yeah, that's a good idea. Let us narrow down." So I had two uh, two people I talked, and uh, one of them is going to be a, a guest on my podcast. So we're kind of working together on narrowing. Uh, and and having the message of the podcast exactly target the people that would benefit most from this um, company services. So, yeah. Okay. What did podcasting teach you, Dennis? Except At for, you know, the tech stuff about uh, mixing files and making an episode <laughs> and hosting and stuff, which we said it's not really a high barrier, high entry barrier. Right. It's, it has taught me that I actually enjoy talking to strangers, which I never thought I would say. So a, a lot of these, the interviews are maybe the first time that I've spoken with uh, these people and it's fun. And you've, you've have to, you have to do it in a certain way because, you know, you're a stranger to them too. So it's like, you have to make them feel comfortable telling these stories. Mm -hmm. And that took some, some practice and, you know, and I enjoy doing the research about uh, the the guests and finding out where they came from and what they what they're trying to do and what the things I was that they impressed like. with the research you did on me and this yeah. is reflected in the questions you were asking I'm like yeah a, a lot of people know say that? that yeah I do I've gotten very good at sort of creative googling um you know in, in YouTube and things like that and I've, I try to find something that they probably never talked about anywhere else 
Mm-hmm. And, and the bunch of people have said that, like, where did you come up with this? Where did I say that before? So, and that, that's fun. I, I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what podcasting taught me is to listen to people. Yes. I'm listen and like really shut up, shut my mouth and listen to what they uh, what they want to say because it i would say it's not something that comes natural to me i i'm more of a talking person i enjoy like i don't know you probably have seen some of my webinars and i'm like so happy because the whole event is for me to talk about something right whereas in podcasting it's about the person you're inviting and about what they bring to the table so you know, you ask questions and you try to uh, have them feel comfortable. But when I was starting to podcast and I was learning and reading about it, um, something that was uh, important that I read was, it's not about you. It's about your guest. And if you have an interview style podcast, your job is to make them talk and to make them talk in a way that's interesting to you and to your audience and not to speak. So I'm like, okay, this is something I have to learn because otherwise I'm not going to be a good podcast host. So I consider myself a decent podcast host because I purposely try to listen and not talk over them. And there is like another, so one part of listening is during the podcast, when you're doing it, when you're asking the question and listening to the answer. The other thing, the other part of listening, I kind of discovered when I prepare the show notes and when I prepare the transcript. And often, you know, you have a backlog of episodes. So it's not that uh, immediately after interviewing somebody, you're releasing the episode, you are working on it a little bit after. And I listen to those podcasts and I'm like, wow, I didn't even, like, I heard it, but I didn't understand it or I didn't get it or I didn't, like, really listen. I was hearing the words, but not listening to the message. So uh, that's cool because then I can kind of convey the second aha moment or, or the real reveal a little bit more in the show notes. And, um, and it taught me that there are like two parts to listening, the hearing and the listening and understanding. Yeah, for sure. So that's, that's something. And, and people, I think, appreciate that, especially, you know, I've had people that it really sounded like, they didn't get to tell their story very often. Then they appreciated mm-hmm. the fact that somebody was listening to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you amplify it by having it on a podcast. Then yeah, more right. people can listen. So if somebody has an interesting message, this is such a cool medium. It's just, especially for runners, you can, you don't have to look at it. I mean, now we're on video, but if you don't like to look at the video, you can just um, listen to it. Maybe yeah. I will make an audio uh, of it as well so that it can be accessible as MP3. So uh, that was um, this, uh, what podcasting taught us, but what has been the most difficult thing about podcasting for you, of, about running a podcast? Well, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's two things for, for me. One is getting, getting the guests and, and scheduling them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that gets easier over time. And the other thing is the editing, which I know we've also talked about before, which is, is it, it, you know, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's a little bit harder, but it's it's probably my least favorite part because it takes the most time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. To me, the most difficult thing is to uh, stay consistent and have it in yeah. regular um regular um, episodes, regular um, distances of time. How do you say it? I don't remember. Anyway, so have it consistently because then when life comes in the way, it's not, you know, my main occupation. So I want to be like you. You have an episode like every week, no matter what, there is people of pathology podcast. My goal is to have it every two weeks. I did take a vacation break, which I think I'm going to keep taking. Uh, I think that was a good thing, but now I want to have every other week. So that's my goal for, for this post-vacational season. Yeah, that gets, uh, the, 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 you know, the every week thing that gets like, 
it's become like this psychological thing for me. Like I have to do it now because I've been doing it that way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes I may, might neglect other things in order to get the, <laughs> to do the episode. Podcast. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. I don't know if that's healthy, but that's, that's where I am right now. Yeah, I guess. So I've read a book about, um, it was a podcaster as well. And he says, oh, his goal was to have um, six weeks or, or th yes, three months of content in advance scheduled already. I'm like, oh, wow, I wish I would get to that point. I don't know when I'm going to get there, but like having at least a buffer of episodes scheduled would be a goal for me. That would that will help me a lot stay consistent and you know consistently provide value um now i i recognize that that wasn't this is a little bit patchy and i have a great audience that doesn't really mind that but if yeah. if, if this is like a resource for you that you're counting on then i think i should um i should work on that on consistency because i have stuff in the backlog and it should come out every other week that's the goal and yeah that was difficult mm -hmm. we yeah. said that the um, barrier to entry is not too high what advice would you give people uh, who are considering to starting a podcast i think you just have to okay decide what you're going to talk about decide how you're going to do it you know with the equipment and whatever and just do it just just you, the, I think the hardest part is to start mm -hmm. and it gets easier from there so if you want to try a podcast do it try it and see what happens and you know if it doesn't work out the first time I mean my first episode wasn't that great so I tried something different for the second one for the third one and you mm -hmm. can keep you know even now I, I keep changing things up you know as I find some better ways to do things or better things to say or things like that and to just if you want to do it just start mm -hmm. that, 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 I, i've seen you advice. evolve like the we are both posting like snippets little video snippets yeah. of our podcast so i've seen you doing that i started doing that as well then i started adding captions to that i saw you started adding captions mm -hmm. as well so you know those little things um, yeah and that stuff is, is fun it's fun to do mm -hmm. i enjoy it mm -hmm. yeah and then you know you see a little bit those little tweaks uh, get you a little bit more engagement more people is listening to that so i i totally second what you say just you know there is gear out there it's not a rocket science those right. like all the microphones they're more or less comparable just pick the one you want mm -hmm. uh, and start doing it and then you know you listen to your podcast episode you see ah the sound quality is maybe not perfect then i don't know get something that dampens your um where you're recording and those little tweaks just start yeah. and uh, one thing uh, when people want to try out i would say you don't have to commit to like a weekly podcast for the rest of your life you can think of a subject that you like plan a couple of episodes and do like a like a like a series that is self-contained it doesn't have to be like uh, something that um that is going to be every week or every other week you check if you like it and then you adapt you can make another series or have something that is every week whatever just you know if you're thinking about it go for it yeah that's one of the great things about about podcasting is you can you, you can constantly change what you're doing and you can try mm -hmm. new things yeah there's no one way to do it i mean it's not it's not tv you know or in radio you can you can do whatever you want mm -hmm. definitely and you know even within the subjects that we chose for ourselves there's so much going on that like really yeah even you know the the podcasts our podcasts are similar they cover the same environment pathology but they have different angle they have different you know way of presenting things so um they're both interesting i would not be afraid of oh somebody is already doing that so i should do something else you just do your thing and there's only one of you and there's going to be people who resonate with you more than with other people who might be doing a similar thing. Yep. So that that's that's something I would say. 
so obviously you listen to podcasts right um me too that's why i'm <laughs> i'm right. doing a podcast what are your favorite non-pathology podcasts okay my my absolute favorite podcast the one that i never miss is called mm -hmm. the jordan harbinger show mm -hmm. and so he does it's it's an interview style podcast and i've actually taken a lot of you know as far as format and some of the questions he's asked and i've learned a lot of these things from that show and i use them in my own um i also uh, you know like i mentioned the running thing there's uh trail runner nation is a good one mm -hmm. ultra runner podcast i listen to both of those while i'm running um and like hockey so i listen to the hockey news podcast oh, okay yeah those are probably my big ones and then there's you know there's a, a few other pathology podcasts so i check out a lot of those as well Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like uh, a lot um, digital marketing and online marketing podcasts. So I started oh. with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V Audio Experience, and sure. he has a media agency and he talks like all all stuff media, all stuff social media, online media. So that was what I, when I started, and then I discovered a couple of different ones. One was. Amy Potterfield, who, who is all, also doing digital marketing. And there I, for example, learned about storytelling for business. And, and I know you're big into storytelling more for, for interviewing people and, and showing, showcasing your guests. Yeah. Um, I, I think she wrote a book too. Yeah, I, I, they all write a book. I think we should yeah, write yeah. a book too. Because there's <laughs> yeah. always a book accompanying, you know, they're marketing specialists. So I guess a book is part of their marketing efforts. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so her I liked. And uh, recently I started listening to Entrepreneurs on Fire, which is a daily interview podcast with different entrepreneurs from like different different areas okay. uh but focuses on the entrepreneurship so yeah i think i've heard of that one yeah yeah so very these popular. are my i don't have something that i follow always and since the beginning i uh, i jump a little bit because then i hear something interesting in one and they are obviously featuring an interesting guest so i go to that guest's podcast and listen for a little bit to their content and like kind of discovering uh, across the area okay yeah that's a, like sort of dabbling i like that mm -hmm. yeah. i do that i don't really because i am um it's like watching a podcast is like watching a tv series i um sometimes after like a couple of seasons i want to switch so okay that's yeah. kind of with the podcast some people are like super faithful and they love the cast and love the the show so much that it doesn't matter like if it changes uh a lot they're gonna watch till the end and mm -hmm. we're like moving into in the matrix <laughs> if we can right. say that no, in I the cannot. podcasting matrix because you know it's connections people are interviewing similar guests and then this guest other guests so yeah. It's like a big network. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Do you have any specific goals for your next season or now the year is we're in the third quarter, fourth, fourth already? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, the goal is always to like increase, you know, the number of listeners. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a constant goal. I try to cover other areas that maybe I haven't touched on yet. And I've been trying to get, uh, it, 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 people from other countries you know kind of outside the u.s and, mm -hmm. and canada and i've gotten like the uk quite a bit i mentioned brazil earlier uh my next episode is a pathologist from finland which is oh, really cool yeah i visited finland on my way to poland uh in the summer because i have a partner uh, partnership with a company from finland so we went there yeah finland sounds amazing and uh she she posts a lot of pictures uh of finland from you know on twitter and things and it just looks beautiful i'd love to go there someday it so, is yeah so that's that kind of like the goals and you know i'm i'm creeping up on it it's probably it's going to be sometime in february but episode 100 so Ooh. i'm in like the the upper 70s right now so come february if if i continue at this pace i'll have 100 and i'm trying to think of something really kind of uh, oh yeah like monumental for that cool let yeah. me know what you come up with 100 yeah. episodes is is uh 
respect, respect. <laughs> yeah. So my goal is I was trying to do that, but due to time constraints and little kids, it was difficult. I want to focus a little bit more on the scientific literature and uh, find a way to um, make it the digestible way in conveying what's new in the literature, in the digital pathology literature uh, through the podcast. So I'm not yet sure how I'm going to do it, but I want to do it next year. So oh, that yeah. not only do I bring the partners from the industry talking about themselves, but also the science and that people can regularly just listen to it. Uh, recently, I published uh, with uh, a friend a paper, a review on uh, the, the newest uh, trends in host light imaging and uh, digital pathology in a veterinary mm. journal, veterinary pathology. So that took us quite some time and resources. And I want to keep the momentum going and bring in research from other people as well into the podcast so um, yeah there's there's uh, so much new research being done in that area image analysis especially mm -hmm. uh, that it's yeah it some of that stuff is really fascinating i mean it's all you know early stage right now but the image analysis and the ai and all of that stuff is, is really cool mm -hmm. that, that, yeah i'm looking forward to that do you do any ai in your lab or your pathologists are familiar with that or no, what, we've got what's a, the extent of digital pathology in your lab. It's not very much. We've got a slide scanner because okay. our frozen section area is separate from the lab. It's in mm -hmm. a different part of the hospital. So they've got a, a scanner that they can, if they need to send an image to somebody down in the lab from oh, up cool. in the frozen section suite, they can do that. But that's really the extent of it right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dennis, for joining me for this chat. And I don't know, maybe for your hundredth episode, we can organize something again. Yeah. Uh, so. Let me yeah. know what you come up with and let's do something cool. Yeah. Obviously, this was great. I recommend highly to that you listen to People of Pathology. And we're going to link the episode where I was the guest in the show notes. Right. But feel free Which to Which is explore. a really good one. Yeah. Feel free to explore your more people than just us there, like almost what upper 70s, upper 70s, 70 yeah. people from the field of pathology. So if you are thinking of going into pathology in you know, one area, one corner or the other, um, go inform yourself in both of our podcasts. And yes. we're going to be honored to have you as our listener. Yes, absolutely. This was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really happy we got to uh, we got to talk again. Yes, too bad the first time didn't work out, but that's okay. We live and we learn. That's right. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dennis. Have a great day. All right, thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.